Good morning, and thank you very much for that introduction. Are you able to hear me fine? Can you hear me okay? Yes. Fine. So if we can go to the first slide. I'm going to be talking this morning about the harm of adult pornography on children. And as a pediatrician, I think it's very important for us to realize that the average age of children who begin to look at adult pornography is 11. In some countries, 13. If we can go to the next slide. As a member of the board of the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children, I've worked for now almost 20 years within the area of images of children that are abusive, what we refer to as child pornography or child sexual abuse images. However, today I'm going to specifically be talking about how it is that children first learn about how to be offenders against other children from adult pornography on the internet. If we could go to the next slide. Children are in a very challenging state in this, in this period in time because they are entering into puberty at a younger age than ever before. The average age of breast development for children in the United States is nine, and for some children as early as eight. Once a child begins, a female child begins to develop breasts, it's going to take about five years before they've completely sexually matured. And when you therefore consider that nine is the starting age, most girls are completely physically sexually mature by 14 years of age. This is significantly earlier than the, in the 1960s when we first started monitoring the age of puberty and how children were developing. Boys will enter into puberty about a year later and will end puberty closer to the age of 16. But while children are physically developing from a sexual perspective, if we can go to the next slide, mentally they are not. In addition to the study and research of sexual maturation, we now have very compelling evidence that children's brains are not developing at the same rate of their bodies. This is a very important thing for us to understand because this particular slide, which shows multiple brain images, uh, reflects the maturation of brains by the color blue. So as you can see from children as young as five, all the way up to over 20, the brain matures from the back of the brain forward. So the first part of the brain to be completely mature is the very back of the brain, and the last part of the brain to become completely mature is the prefrontal cortex. In fact, the research has shown that the prefrontal cortex is not completely mature until almost 25 years of age. Why is this important? The prefrontal cortex is that part of the brain that allows children to make good decisions, common sense, emotional control, and be able to filter and reason about things that they may see, hear, or experience. So now that we know that the prefrontal cortex is the last part of the brain to mature, it helps us to recognize why children are so susceptible, they are so vulnerable, to things that are clearly not appropriate for them to see, but not only that, they will act out what they see because they fail to recognize that it's not socially acceptable nor is it emotionally acceptable. If you can go to the next slide, I also want to point out that in addition to the brain not being completely mature until almost 25 years of age, since 2007 we have additional research that helps us to understand that there are newer parts of the brain that we did not know about that were associated with vision. Before, we thought all it took for you to see something and understand what you see was to have an eye, a cornea, an optic nerve, and the back part of the brain. But since 2007, research from Italy and now many other countries has helped us to recognize that all over the brain, there are multiple parts of the brain unrelated to vision that help us process what we're seeing. And these are called mirror neurons. So these mirror neurons that are in the brain, in fact, convince us that when we see something, we are experiencing what we see. If you can go to the next slide, I'll explain this a little bit better. 
if all of us in this room were looking at a movie right now and we were in a car chase, watching a car chase, and it, we were seemingly inside the car, and everything is going past the windows very rapidly, many people in the audience would begin to lean forward, they would begin to have an increase in their heart rate, some would start breathing a little bit more rapidly, because very well, the mirror neurons in your brain would be convincing you that you are experiencing what you're seeing in that movie. If then the car were to crash in the movie, a significant number of people in the audience today would collectively gasp because for that brief second, your brain would have totally convinced you that what you saw was what you were experiencing. Take that knowledge base and apply it to youth who are looking at adult pornography on the internet. Not only are they seeing things for the very first time that they've never seen before, but the more that they look at this content, the more their bodies are going to respond as if they are experiencing what they are seeing. And if you have the brain research that reveals that part of your brain is responding to what you're seeing and part of your body, not the brain, that is the sexual components of your body are also responding to that. Those are two very, very um, impressive and highly motivating responses of the human body. And it is for this reason that we have to be most concerned about children who are accessing internet pornography. There's additional research in the mirror neuron field that helps us to know that there's a big difference between looking at a still image and looking at a video image. Video images are much more sticky, the term is used, because not only are you watching what is happening, but you're also hearing what is happening, which is not what you experience when you see a still image. And the majority of adult pornography now on the internet is video in nature. If you could go to the next slide. We are in a society that I refer to as the perfect storm. So many things are happening that can make children have difficulties. This is a shockless society. We have many children who have mental health dysfunction. And online bullying is at an all-time high. We have a normalization of sexual harm. This is a dynamic that has been, in fact, written about by the American Psychological Association in a special task force report that talks about the sexualization of girls and how if you have very young girls, as young as three and four and five, and you dress them in highly sexualized clothing, and you refer to them as young adults, little hot mama, oh hot baby, phrases like that, this sexualization of girls, the American Psychological Association has helped us to recognize, begins to encourage and influence children to do something called sexually self-objectify. That means that children will begin to see themselves as an object, as a sexual object, not as a person. And so what the APA report showed is that when children are sexually objectified, they no longer feel that they are adequate if they're bright students. They're no longer adequate if they're excellent musicians. They're no longer adequate if they're outstanding athletes. If they are not sexy, they're not okay. And so this normalization of sexual harm and the sexualization of children is another part of the perfect storm. Our runaway children, our thrown away children, and our homeless youth are at greater risk, we think, than ever to sexual exploitation through sex trafficking and, and in fact, to have been victims of pornography production. I've seen many cases where street children in foreign countries were groomed and lured by commercial traffickers, fed, and then placed in hotel rooms where they are shown adult pornography and then encouraged to have mutual sexual contact with each other, which is videotaped and made commercially available as child pornography. The term childhood adversities also reflects the fact that when children have had, have been victims of child abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, and especially sexual abuse, 
as well as family dysfunction, including intimate partner violence or domestic violence in a home, parents that have mental health problems, parents who have drug problems. Many of these childhood adversities we now know cause these children to have a higher susceptibility to being victimized as they grow older, as well as ongoing major health problems to include obesity, increased incidence of cancer, high blood pressure and heart disease, and in fact, an earlier death. Part of this perfect storm includes technology improvements. Today, we know that just like you can buy pay for use adults, you can do the same for children. And because of social networking, youth are beginning to mimic what they've seen in adult pornography in their relationships and social networking. Online dating sites are also becoming a source of exploitation of children and adults. And internet pornography is another component of that. If you consider the fact that sexual violence in every country contributes to the um, lack of quality of life for children, especially when there's ethnic poverty, we have a perfect storm. And finally, from the standpoint of cyber stalking, an individual who is talking to a child over and over and trying to convince them that they should send images of themselves, almost in a stalking fashion, we have a perfect storm. The gang culture, drug addiction, and sexual addiction are additional components. Could we go to the next slide, please? So when we think about the harm to children by adult pornography, let me just highlight for you these important pieces. The first, which is on your lower right-hand corner, are adults who look at adult pornography as a plan for child sexual abuse. Many adults who look at adult pornography become sexually excited, but they don't have someone that they can sexually assault, and children are most easily available. When you look at the histories of individuals who are sex offenders, almost always they began this behavior with children. In the next block, adults who view adult pornography and make sexually explicit materials to network with like-minded people are the beginnings of online predators and something that we see rather often with adult pornography use. The next block shows that adults who use adult pornography will sometimes entice youth to self-produce. This is becoming the new definition of love. And unfortunately, what happens in the online world is that an adult is talking to a youth, but not presenting themselves as an adult. They may present themselves as a youth who's just a little bit older. And you know, I love you so much. Could you just send me a video of you pleasuring yourself? This is the kind of terminology that is usually used in the online world to encourage youth to self-produce. When we think about adults who show adult pornography to children, to sexually educate them and to seduce them. For years we have seen this within the context of child sexual abuse and a common method of exploitation of children. Once children have been shown adult pornography by a sex offender and told this is what people do when they love each other and this is what you and I should do because we love each other, it's very hard for children, especially young children, to understand that this is not right. Consequently, they become what we refer to as compliant victims because they don't know that what is happening to them is unacceptable. And typically, this can go on for years. Often, the offender will continue to show a child all different types of adult pornography in order to get the child to attempt to mimic many of the things that they've seen on videos or in the online world. Teens who look at adult pornography, we know, will become sexually excited and maybe even habituated or addicted to adult pornography. And this is when you will find an increase in offending against children. I am very sad to report how many cases I have had to testify in where a youth offender had sexually abused a much younger child because they were in a room looking at adult pornography on a computer, became very sexually excited, and most importantly, disinhibited, and looked around the room for some person with whom they could reenact what they had seen, and often it is a younger child. So this aspect of sex offending against a child is not because this youth has a sexual interest in children, 
It's not because they are, in fact, a pedophilic person, but because they have been sexually excited by adult pornography and the child is the only person available to them. Finally, if we look at teens who look at adult pornography and sexually assault peers as a plan for dating violence, this is a very big component of what we're beginning to see more and more around the world. Teen dating violence or adolescent relationship abuse is another term that's used in the literature, is becoming more and more commonly associated with individuals who have not only looked at adult pornography, but then produced videos of their actual sexual assault of a teen partner. This actual sexual assault then is frequently used, the video of it, often on a cell phone, in order to blackmail the teen victim into silence. And if teen victims appear to want to approach the police or ask for justice, these individuals will threaten to put these online or onto their Facebook pages, and this will absolutely silent victims for times to come. The final aspect of harm to children by adult pornography are when teens and children who are looking at adult pornography start to look at this slippery slope of barely legal images. That's what they're called online, barely legal. These are meant to be adult women who are made to look like teenagers. And then finally, when they search around for even more graphic and more unusual and more difficult to find images, they will stumble onto child sexual abuse images or child pornography. And so these are all the different ways that we can see children who are harmed in cyberspace and because of adult pornography. Could you go to the next slide, please? Children learn what they see. And this is just a news clip, one of thousands, that show children sexually offending against other children and videotaping that sexual offending. Where did a child learn to videotape the sexual abuse they're committing against another child? Where did they learn that? They learned that from the internet. They learned that from adult pornography. Children absolutely learn what they see. When I was on the uh, National Task Force of Children Exposed to Violence, we went to the city of Baltimore, Maryland, and heard an imam speak about how their mosque was working so hard to try to raise and help the young men to be honest and to be respectful of people. And he spent some time in his testimony before our task force regarding the steps that they were taking. One of the things that he said was that he often told young men, what you see is what you get. So you have to be careful about what you see. I think that's a very good take home message. But you know what? If you'll go to the next slide, please. At the end of his testimony, there before the task force, he said, now I have had to change what I say to young men over these last 25 years. I can no longer say what you see is what you get. Now I have to say what you see is what gets you. Those are very, very wise words. And as a country, as a region, as a world, we have to begin to protect children more effectively from the extremely violent and antisocial nature of what is evident in adult pornography on the internet. We have to protect children from these particular images and we have to provide for them counter messages because when a child grows up believing that sex involving two, three, or four men and one female is normal, you can see how we are having a situation that can actually lead our children right down the track of the criminal justice system. If we could go to the final slide. Because of this, I have felt it's very important for us to look at this downward slope this slope of looking at adult pornography to barely legal images and finally to the production of abusive images of children. And I believe it's going to be tomorrow. We'll have an opportunity to share with you a documentary that I've been involved in that really talks about the importance of these images of children because these are not just pictures. It is going to be um, 
something that I'll introduce more in depth tomorrow. But today, the take home message that I want to make sure everyone hears is that adult pornography is not an innocuous web searching, no big deal behavior. It is one of the most, adult pornography is one of the top five items searched by children today on the internet. And because of that, if we don't make the internet a safer place for children, we can't put the onus of not accessing these materials only on children and their families. We in fact really need to make the internet a safer place so that children are not able to access these types of materials. I want to thank you very much for your attention and if there are any questions or comments, I'm more than happy to address any of those at this time. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharon Cooper. Thank you for providing us with a clearer understanding of this challenge, as indeed the Dr. Layden before that, you will agree that this challenge is about as subtle as a Category 5 hurricane. Both professionals, of course, have helped us to start to unravel its root cause, and by the end of the weekend, as I said, we will have a clearer understanding on an approach to this problem. Two masterful presentations. We thank both Dr. Cooper and Dr. Layden, but I'm sure you've developed some curiosities and some questions. We have two microphones that have been strategically placed across the room. Uh, if you have questions, I ask that you go to the microphone to facilitate, especially Dr. Cooper, who is with, stayed with us by Skype, and ask your questions. So the floor is now open to questions from any person in the audience. question is specifically for Dr. Cooper, you may say so, or Dr. Layden, both are available. Blessed morning, everyone. Um, I think the question might be to both, and it concerns um, the protection of children via the information that sh they should be receiving, and I'm particularly interested in the younger children and the whole concept of sex education and the role that that might play and what type of education that we need to be exposing and information that we should be exposing our young children to, to provide a counter to what they are getting on the internet and what people will be feeding them. So I'd like to hear a bit more of what type of education, if sex education is needed, and what type of sex education for younger children. Thank you very much. Yes, may I answer that question? Uh, Dr. Layden, maybe you tackle, you would probably need to come. Am I able to answer that question at this point? Yes. Thank you very much for asking that question. Yes, we definitely have to educate children, but we have to educate parents first because parents who put their children on autopilot with technology are placing their children at risk. A lot of these parents don't know this when they buy technology for their children, especially if they have smartphones or iPads for children that can access the internet they feel that their children are strictly going to be entertaining themselves or educating themselves on appropriate materials. But many of these devices, if not uh, provided with filters and blocking agents by the parents ahead of time, will readily allow uh, abusive images to be seen by children. There are numerous agencies, and the National Center for Missing and Exploited Children is one of them, that uh, has online wonderful safety messages that are made just for children, children under the age of five, a different group for children between five and nine years of age, and a different one for children between 10 and 17 years of age that really talk about how to be safe in the online world. And it's not just about avoiding an offender, but really also being careful about what you see and what you say in the online world. In particular, these, um, these particular uh, uh, educational pieces can be viewed online, but also children can receive materials monthly in the mail, coloring books and things of that nature from the National Center that will make it available 
for them to be used in a school setting or in youth serving organization settings to talk about this is not okay I need to tell my mommy or my daddy that this was not good and can they help it go away um, so if the, anyone wants to go to NetSmarts which is N-E-T-S-M-A-R-T-Z dot org you will find a wealth of materials Canada has a very similar um, number of teaching things to be used in schools as well as for ch younger children and so if you go to the Canadian Center for Child Protections website especially the site called Need Help Now which is an excellent site that teenagers can go to and talk to someone right away if they have made their own images and are fearful that they've lost control of those images and how can they talk to their parents about this and how can they try to regain control and so definitely I would say you would want to look at these for two, two particular resources or the Marie Collins Foundation which is in Europe um, which also provide very appropriate child specific educational materials uh, I'd like to confirm what, what Dr. Cooper has said that our first step has to make sure that the images don't go into the minds of children. We've got to, it's harder to get them out once they're in. But I also, I also believe we've got to do the other side, which is um, the parents, the school, and the church need to work together to design and implement and talk to children about the positive aspects of sexuality. And parents are often reticent to talk to their children about the positive aspects of sexuality. And I know it's difficult, but you've got to do it. And it, so knowing what the negative messages are, knowing that pornography is, is telling your children that sex is not intimate, that it's not a, has got an emotional involvement, making clear messages to the children that say this is intimate, it is about emotional involvement, um, that there are uh, emotional consequences to sex, that the, the schools in the United States spend a lot of time just talking about how to protect yourself from either sexually transmitted diseases or how to physically function sexual, sexually, but they don't talk about the emotional and psychological pieces. So making sure you're saying to the children, you want to have sex in a, um, a, an intimate way, in a connected way, and for most parents that means saying to the children in a committed way, that the only relationships that are safe are committed relationships, and that's where sexuality belongs, in committed relationships. And for most people, that means marriage. But so saying to the child, I want you to understand the psychological nature of this, and it's positive, and it's wonderful, and it's lovely, and it's about connection, and it's about um, the two of you expressing your love for each other in this physical way, counters that negative message. But you're not going to counter those pictures just with words. You've got to keep the pictures out of their minds because we're not going to come up with a model that says we're going to show you p pictures of loving people have sex like we're probably not going to do that uh, you know i know even sex therapists are now using you know um, stick drawings of people having sex so they don't have to show the pictures but you've got to come up with something that's powerful that's loving that's intimate that's psychologically healthy that tells children that sex is supposed to be wonderful it's not supposed to be degraded it's not supposed to be violent like that what you see so first don't let the pictures go in and then secondly work to develop a narrative in your family and start early I'm sorry most of us have started too late you've got to start talking to children about sexuality very early age appropriately but very very early sometimes they don't wait until they wait until they're 16 way too late 10 now too late <laughs> start early thank you I hope that satisfied the no, personal no. question I need, I need to add something to that really quick. I'm one of your presenters, but I need to put the law component on there as well. Okay, I'm a law enforcement instructor with the Department of Homeland Security, and as far as teaching our parents, parents and children also need to know all of those things that Dr. Cooper talked about, what Dr. Layton talked about, but we also need to, parents need to understand what the law says because they don't know the difference between what is wrong and then what the law says are the consequences of those behaviors. So we need to make sure that you always incorporate the legal aspect that, of that in there so parents will have an understanding and then they can explain that to their children or you can have someone from um, the legal side explain it in an age appropriate way as well. Thank you.
just to uh, make mention again of the sites Dr. Cooper spoke about, NetSmarts and Need Help Now, you may want to jot that down. Any other questions from the floor? If not, we'll, we've already had a lot to digest today, and there is considerably more, of course, to come during the course of today and tomorrow. However, at this time, according to the program, we take a 30-minute break. Let me remind you, there are three food stations, so service should be pretty quick. And uh, in about half an hour's time, we will, of course, reassemb reassemble to continue what is a national conversation protecting children from the harmful effects of pornography. Thank you for your attention for the first phase this morning. We relax for 30 minutes and then reassemble.